good morning. It's good to see you today. We are in week two of our new sermon series called Outsiders, and what we're doing over the next few weeks is we are considering the words of Hebrews chapter 13, where Jesus calls us to join Him outside the camp. And Pastor Jason set that up for us last week, so if you weren't here, go back and listen to that message to get the context, because today we are really just going to jump in, and we're going to focus on what the writer of Hebrews says about how we join Jesus outside the camp, how we are outsiders in this idea of marriage. So if you have a Bible, look at Hebrews 13 and verse 4, and let's read the verse that we're going to consider this morning. And it says this, let marriage be held in honor by all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Now, today, we are going to focus on that first phrase, let marriage be held in honor by all. A little later this month, we're going to pick up and look at the second part of that passage at the end of the month. But today, our focus is how do we honor marriage? Now, before we get there, though, I need to just say something quickly here for us. It's, It's an important topic that needs clarity. Today, As we focus on marriage, here is what we are not doing in that. We are not in any way trying to diminish singleness. God calls some people to singleness. So if you were here today and you were single, we are in no way diminishing that by looking at marriage. If you have walked through the pain and the heartache of divorce, we are in no way making light of that today by talking about marriage. Here is what we are doing, though. We are simply practicing our conviction that this is the Word of God, and it is the authority for our lives, and we must talk about the things that Scripture talks about. We must focus and value the things that Scripture values, and we must look at what God's Word has to say. So today, as we look at marriage, I just wanted to start off by saying that what the writer of Hebrews says, that everyone, that marriage should be held in honor by all, that tells me something, that all of us today have the opportunity to learn something this morning from God's Word as He teaches us what He wants us to see about marriage this morning. And it's a hot topic. Amen? We hear about marriage all the time. We see marriage all the time. Our culture is trying to define it and redefine it and redefine the redefinition of marriage. It's, it, is, it is a buzzword. You guys have heard statistics for many years about marriage, that half of all marriages end in divorce. Now, those numbers may be changing for some, of the, for some reasons, but that we're going to talk about here in just a minute. But here's the thing. Here's the one thing that is staggering when it comes to statistics, that the statistics outside the church about marriage hold true inside the church. And so it's important for us to look at this and for us to talk about this this morning. There's a recent article in the last three years or so that Focus on the Family published, and it is talking about the future of Christian marriage. And this was a fascinating article because it looked at marriage just over the last several generations in our country and even in, even in, in, in civilized, developed nations in the world. And it said several generations ago, if you ask one of our senior adults in the room today about marriage, if they were to talk to you about their relationship relationship and how they met their spouse and and how they approached marriage, they would say it was a foundation for their life. In other words, they got married and then they kind of figured out life together, right? Then they got busy with with careers and, and, and goals and all of those things. But here was the fascinating thing with this article. It said this, that when you look at the landscape of marriage now, it has moved from a foundation to more of a capstone idea of marriage. In other words, this, people today, younger generations today, view marriage as just one of the boxes you check in this process of life, right? I'm going to travel. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to get a job. And and then I'll, you know, I'll check the marriage box, maybe. It's not a foundation. It's more of a capstone. After I figured everything else out, 
Now, that may sound like, okay, well, two different views, but it's had significant impact in our world. It's, it's had a physical impact in our world. People are getting married later, which has also really cratered the fertility rate in, in developed civilized nations. So that's what physical impact it's had, but it's had an emotional and a spiritual impact because in in making marriage more of a capstone rather than a foundation for life as far as how we view it, it has normalized cohabitation. It has normalized premarital sex. And it's also done some significant things in the church. If you were to poll younger generations, they would tell you that marriage is between a man and a woman for life. They would even tell you that marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. But because we have moved marriage, we don't value it like we have in the past, they would say, but that really doesn't matter that I understand that's what the Bible says. That's not what I'm going to practice. We've marginalized the importance of marriage as a culture and as a civilization, and it is having impact in our lives in in significant ways. So we've kind of demoted it to just something else on a list of objectives rather than a foundation on which to build a life as we as we live together with our spouse in a covenant relationship and work on these objectives and goals and dreams and 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 life together so that's kind of a landscape if you will of what's going on in our culture and so you might be sitting here today and you might say well yeah I understood that. And, and I would tell you this, if you were just going to say, tell me, tell me, if I were to poll you and say, what do you think about marriage? You might say this, marriage is in crisis. We have a crisis when it comes to marriage. We don't define it correctly. We don't practice marriage the way the Bible tells us to practice marriage. But here's the thing, I've got good news for you today. Marriage is not in crisis. God is very clear in his word about what marriage is and how we live within a marriage relationship in a way that glorifies God. Marriage is not the crisis. What we have, I would tell you, is more of a theological crisis. We don't want to believe what God says about marriage. We don't want to practice marriage the way God lays out for us to practice marriage as followers of Jesus Christ. So today, as we look at what it means for us as believers to join Jesus outside the camp in the way that we honor marriage, I want us to consider this morning three things that will help us answer that question of how do we honor marriage. The first one is this, we must think biblically about marriage. If we're going to honor marriage, if we're going to honor God with marriage, then we've got to think about marriage the way God does. And simply this, if you take one thing away from what I mean by that, it would be this. Did you know that the whole story of the Bible is actually told in terms of a marriage covenant? We don't have time to walk through the whole thing, but we could go to Genesis chapter 2 when God had created Adam and and he says, it's not good for the man to be alone. And so he caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he took one of his ribs and he made Eve. And then he said, now this is good, right? And he says, and for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. We see this from the very beginning, God ordaining and blessing marriage and it as a covenant relationship. But then as we move on, if we got to Genesis chapter 15, God establishes a covenant with Abraham. And he does that by the same thing. He causes Abraham to fall into a deep sleep. And he reaffirms the promise that he made to Abraham that through your descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed. It's it's similar language. And then we would get to Exodus chapter 34, the descendants of Abraham who have been slaves in Egypt come out of Egypt and at the foot of Mount Sinai. God establishes a covenant with them that says, you will be my people like my bride. That is the language he uses. I will be your husband. You will be my bride. I will provide for you. I will protect you. I will care for you. And you will be faithful to me. He even says, don't chase after other gods. And he uses language of a relationship. He says, don't whore after other gods. So we see this language 
language continue to be used, but Israel does the very thing that God tells them not to do. And so in Isaiah and Jeremiah and in Hosea and other prophets, God says, listen, you've not been faithful to our marriage and I am going to divorce you. But then he says, Isaiah chapter 54, but I will bring you back to myself. I will restore you. I will reconcile our relationship. Psalm speaks to this. Did you know Song of Solomon speaks to this? It talks about this very thing, celebrating the marriage of the king to his bride. That is looking forward to, spiritually speaking, to the day when the king that comes from the line of David will come and he will be united and restored to his bride. What is that pointing to? It's pointing to Jesus. When we get to the New Testament, we see Jesus introduce himself as the bridegroom in Matthew chapter 9, Matthew 25, John chapter 3, and and several other places in the Gospels. Jesus talks about himself as the bridegroom who has come to inaugurate this new covenant where, as we've just seen a few weeks ago, In Revelation 19 and Revelation 21, it says that the bride will be presented to the bridegroom. Amen? So the whole story of Scripture, if we think biblically, it is a story of marriage. And with this high view of marriage that we see, it forces us to say, well, if marriage is that significant that God would tell the whole story of what He's doing in terms of marriage then my marriage takes on a lot greater weight as a follower of Jesus Christ. And I would say, you're absolutely right, it does. And the second thing then that we must consider about how we honor marriage is this right here. We must die daily. We must think biblically, but we must die daily. The call to join Jesus outside the camp in Hebrews 13 is ultimately a call to die, to die to self. And those of you here today who are married, you can attest to this, that there is no relationship that you have on earth that forces you to confront your selfishness, your pride, your self-centeredness, your ego, your own desires more than marriage. Because marriage forces you to think about others, your spouse more than you do yourself, or it should. And when we don't, that's where friction comes in in marriage. But marriage, God uses marriage to sanctify us. There is a book, if you ever ask me to marry you, just know, I'll tell you right now, I'm going to make you read the book, Sacred Marriage, before I will agree to marry you. And here is why. Because the writer, Gary Thomas, poses an incredible question, and he says, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than make us happy? Now, we can, feel, we can find fulfillment in marriage, and we can be happy in marriage, but when we set happiness as our ultimate goal in marriage, we are setting ourselves up for disappointment, and we are setting ourselves up to say, well, if I'm no longer happy, then I must no longer need to be married. But God has a bigger plan for marriage than our happiness alone, and it is our holiness. He uses it to to push us to die to ourselves, to, to, to depend upon Him to be what He has called us to be within the bonds and within this covenant of marriage. And then the last thing I want us to consider this morning together, and I want to spend most of our time on this because those first two points, very high level, theological, if you will, but this last one is practical, and I want us to talk about this. We must think biblically, we must die daily, but if we are going to honor marriage as followers of Jesus Christ, we must invest in our marriages consistently. Now. I get the privilege of doing marriage counseling on a fairly regular basis. But here's one of the things, as I love doing it, and I know there is great value in doing it, and so don't hear me wrong, it is right and it is good when you are struggling in your marriage to seek help, to seek people to mentor and walk alongside you to help you be able to work through that. But one of the things that I realize so often 
is that the couples that I work with, one of the reasons they are there and their marriage is, is got struggle or issues to work through is because most likely there was not a consistent investment in marriage on a regular basis. They weren't pouring into their marriage, right? We often neglect to invest in our marriages until there's actually problems. And so one of the things that we could do to put guardrails up in our lives and in our marriages is just to commit to working on our marriage consistently, regularly. And so this morning, we have an incredible privilege to hear from a special couple here in our church. So I want you to help me welcome Rick and Sue Hugler to the stage. Yeah. It's good to see you guys this morning. Good to be here. (laughs) Hello. Rick and Sue lead our marriage ministry at the church. They have mentored and walked alongside several couples over the years here at FBC. They lead our marriage and family growth group. And we are excited this morning to have a conversation around this last point about investing consistently in our marriage. But before we get there, I want to give you guys a couple of minutes here. All right? Yeah. And a couple of minutes. Here. So real quickly, Rick and Sue, we've been married 40 years last July. Um, amen. Um, and God brought us to First Baptist Church very specifically to start a marriage ministry. Back in 2010, we started a marriage ministry with three other couples, and we started teaching marriage classes. We started doing marriage mentoring, and. Uh, God has grown our marriage through that, and so we're excited about the church offering marriage training and marriage enrichment in uh, During Family Matters. So just a couple of points to add to that. We were both in the military, which means we are very strong-willed, opinionated people, both used to getting our own way. So do you think that brings struggle to your marriage? Oh, yes. Okay. (laughs) Then as God would have it, at a very young age, I had cancer, cervical cancer. So we were unable to have children of our own. But God is good. And in this very room, we brought in children of choice. They may not be biological, but there are people in this very room who are either children or grandchildren of the Hugglers because we are a family in this church. And I think the last thing I want to share, and uh, we are the comic relief this morning, but the last thing I want to share first, marriage must be important because Satan tried to interrupt this service. Amen. He tried to interrupt your worship. He tried to interrupt you being able to hear what our pastors share about God's truth. But our job is to stand in the gap. The battle belongs to him. And marriage is work. First Corinthians talks about if you marry, you will struggle. So here's a quick story. Here's this couple in a marriage ministry, First Baptist. And if any of you can say amen to relate, Chopper, uh, I want to be able to say we're on our way to church and we're bickering. We are not happy with each other. We are struggling, okay? Just being honest and transparent. Just fulfilling scripture. Just (laughs) honoring scripture. And so we pull up to the church. It wasn't a current pastor, so... Pastor Daniel, our boss, is off the hook. But I've not heard you up, fight, so. <laughs> no, oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> we pull up to the church. My husband lets me out. I open the court car door, and I say, notice my face, notice my tone, my body language. I wish you would grant me the same grace you grant everybody else. And I slam the door. <laughs> And the family pastor was not 50 feet away. Hi, pastor. Hi, pastor. (laughs) Welcome to the marriage ministry. Yes, we're, we're honest. And so I say all that to end with, like pastor said, what we have learned in our own marriage is many of us 
don't know what God has to say about marriage. We don't know. We're not educated, and we want to spend time in God's Word. Amen? Amen. 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 So thank you guys. I, I so appreciate both of your commitment and your, your passion, the calling God has placed on you to help come alongside this body of believers and help us invest in marriages. And I mean, what a, what a testimony, what a, what a rich treasure that is to have you guys here, the transparency, right? But the love with which you do it, uh, I'm so thankful for that. And as we were preparing for today, we sat down and had a conversation in my office, and you got a handout. Two and a half hours. Yes, sir. We had a working uh, lunch and afternoon together working through this, and you have the product of that conversation in your hands today as you came in. If you didn't get one of these, make sure you get one on your way out today. But basically, we started with this question. We were thinking about this idea of investing in our marriages. And so I posed a question to Rick and Sue, and I said, what could we do each week to invest in our marriages? And so we came up with three things that we want to have a conversation about this morning to answer that. What could we do as we leave here today to invest in our marriages? And so the very first one, we talked about... God's Word. So talk to us a little bit. How does God's Word help us invest in our marriage on a daily basis? Yeah, when Pastor Daniel asked us that question, we immediately thought, well, when we mentor couples, we ask that we tell them, every time we get together, we're going to ask you three questions. We're going to ask three things of you, and the very first of those is to tell us, have you spent time in God's Word this past week or these past two weeks? And more importantly, is God's Word spending time in you? Colossians 3.16, let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Because here's the truth, we've never had a couple come to us struggling in their marriage, but having a vibrant Bible reading, Bible sharing time in their marriage. Mm. One is a reflection of the other. The, The vertical relationship is reflected in the horizontal relationship. And so one of the habits that we want to create in our marriages here in First Baptist Church and in the community is, are you spending time in God's Word? The other thing I would add is, God says, as we said earlier, if you marry, you will struggle. Everybody struggles in their marriage. And yet, that's the very thing we don't talk about. We don't take our stuff to the foot of the cross and share it and come alongside and bring it to a church family so that we can talk about what's it like? What is the role of the husband? What's his job? What's my job to submit to my man and honor him as Christ submitted to the church? Am I willing to be honest about it so that others can grow and learn of God, and what legacy am I leaving? Yeah. Yeah, when Pastor Daniel came to the church, I don't know if you all remember, he ordered a bunch of books and had every family given this book, and that book was Gospel Fluency by Jeff Vanderstone. Um, And we recently in our growth group went through that, and and the, the premise of that book is, are we gospel fluent in our lives, in our marriage, in our yeah. relationships. Yeah, because that, that is really it, right? That's, that's the press for us this morning is, is we've got to say, do we really believe that Scripture has the answers for, for my marriage, to help me have a healthy marriage, to, to, to deal with conflict and struggles and challenges that I face in my marriage? Right? We, we, we will trust God's Word. Well, yeah, it has, it has answers for my salvation, for my spiritual condition, but so many times we neglect to go to God's Word and say, does it have answers for all the matters of life? And and the gospel does. It absolutely does. So part of spending time in God's Word is to help us develop that conviction that, that God's Word has the answers for the things that I deal with in my life. Yes. Amen? So Amen. So for example, after God, who comes first? in your family? Is it your spouse or is it something else? Mm. 
or someone else or your kids. We all sacrifice to better our family, to raise our children, and we do it. And we sacrifice ourselves, and we sacrifice our marriage. And one day you roll over, and you look at your mate, and you go, do I know you? Right? Do I like you? Do I even like you? <laughs> right? Who are you? <laughs> and, and so it begins. Yeah. And so tied to this idea of are we spending time in God's word individually, together, spiritual conversations. Take 30 seconds. How do we have, what is an easy way to have a spiritual conversation with your spouse? Give us a practical way to do that. So I would say, uh, are you generous in your marriage? Meaning, is it all about you? Or is it about us? Okay. And so as we learn to communicate, uh, are we watching our tone, our language, word choice? How do we resolve conflict and things like that? And so number two on the list here is praying together. So that's the second question we ask couples is, are you praying together? There's a phrase that people say here in this very church, people who pray together, let me hear it. Oh, wait, let me hear it again with conviction, people. (laughs) People who pray together. Thank you. So as you look at your card, are you willing to pray together, not just at the dinner table? Are you willing to pray out loud without judging how each other prays? Can you be vulnerable? Can you speak honestly to your Lord? Uh, We had a conversation with Pastor. Think of this as spiritual intimacy. Now, we're not talking about the marriage bed. We will have future conversations about that. That's right. But to be. Look at all the guys. They just perked up. They just perked up. (laughs) But to be with your mate, open before God, speaking to Him. There is nothing more intimate. Family, when I listen to my man pray, and he admits his struggle, that he's fighting something or he's worried about something, he does not want to fail, and he doesn't know how to say it out loud to me, but he talks to God, and I hear his heart that promotes understanding, which promotes spiritual conversation. Amen. Amen. So, so something about prayer also, um, a, as we go along in marriage, it's very common in marriage to drift. And during our workshop, we have a marriage workshop, first and second March, foot stomper, put that on your calendar. We'll do an exercise that shows you that we tend to drift in our marriage. Prayer moves us in the, in the opposite direction, toward right. one another. So it's very important. It's the glue in marriage that moves us toward one another and acknowledges God is at the center of our marriage. Yeah, these are foundations, if you will. We could view both of these, time in God's word, having spiritual conversations, talking about things together, and praying together out loud where we can be vulnerable, transparent, hear each other's heart, encourage each other. These are laying a foundation that really is the core of intimacy Mm -hmm. that just strengthens that marriage bond, that all the other things then that we have, the Th- those stresses and those, those just life circumstances that want to chip away at our marriage. If we're investing in that foundation, we can weather those storms so much better than we ever could without that foundation. But the thing we neglect so often is that foundation. So both of these pieces, how do we invest in our marriage every week? In the foundation, in God's word, in prayer together. But then I want to talk about a third one that we, that we spoke about. What is this third way? We said, we phrased it by blessing and serving our spouse in their love language. What is that all about? And how is that so important in regular yeah, so investment? So that's number three. So that's the big three we ask. Have you spent time in God's word? Are you praying together? And then how have you blessed your spouse in their love language? 
Sue and I were married 15 years before we ever took the five love languages quiz. And in those 15 years, I was convinced I loved my wife more than she loved me. And why he was, was that? wrong, but yeah. yes. <laughs> but why was that, right? I'm acts of service, off the charts acts of service. I'm doing the vacuuming, doing the dishes, warming up her car. And she thinks those are all wonderful things. I married a great guy. Yeah, but her love language is words of affirmation and physical touch. In other words, don't show me you love me. Tell me you love me. Right. right? That's what I need to hear. So we're just two ships passing in the night, expressing love as we know it and understand it, but not talking in our spouse's love language. So one of the things we ask couples is, all right, learn your spouse's love language, and then on a regular basis, weekly, find ways to bless them in their love language. That's so good. It really does help because like Pastor said, when you do go through times of struggle, the effort to purposefully set out to bless your spouse, to be sacrificial, to honor, to forgive, and continue to show is a direct reflection of your personal relationship with your Lord and Savior. And it really does work, and it gets you through those difficult times. Yeah. And the other thing I'd want to emphasize is we live today in a consumer-driven culture. Right. What am I getting? Right? That's our attitude. And what am I getting out of my marriage? And if I'm unhappy, I'm not getting what I need out of my marriage. That's not God's design for marriage. God's design for marriage is, what am I giving? How, how am I giving? Uh, two people giving in a marriage, that is a healthy, strong marriage. And when we're blessing each other in our spouse's love language, we're thinking about giving, not getting. That's the agape love. And the last thing I'll say on this is, if you can't tell, we're very passionate about God's design for marriage and are we honoring it. And we strongly believe that where your marriage goes, so goes your family. And where your family goes, so goes your church. And where the church goes, so goes the community. So are we willing to stand for our Lord and Savior and honor what he says in all things. And where does God want to attack that the most? In our marriage. Yes, start, start there, right? It crumbles everything else around it, right? That's that fabric. Guys, thank you all so very much. Can we give Rick and Sue, just thank them this morning? I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for having us. Taking time to, to spend with us today. So you guys got cards as you, um, as you came in this morning. One side just is a review of what we talked about today. How do we invest in our marriage on a regular basis with those three, those three points that we just had a discussion? There's some suggestions there for you of how to get in God's Word, of how to spend time in prayer together, and even a little bit of a push towards serving and blessing each other in your love language. Before you head home today, spouses, See if you can figure out what your top two love languages are and what you think your spouses are. It'll make for great conversation over lunch today. And then if you want to just confirm it, we gave you the link to be able to take the quiz and get your results so that you can get started today with blessing and serving each other in your love language. So we wanted to give you some practical tools to be able to invest in your marriage, but we also wanted you to hear this. Clearly this morning, as a church, we are committed to investing in marriages. And so on the other side of that card, you are going to see some of the ways that we do that. We have growth groups. We have a marriage and family growth group, formerly known as Marriage Enrichment. That group is growing, and God is using that group so much that we are going to start a second one at the 9 o'clock hour, and that begins next Sunday. So if you're a young couple and you are looking for a growth group, maybe you're newlyweds, what, I can't think of a better group for you to get plugged into, and the lead 
leaders of that group are going to be in the foyer right after this service. The hugglers are also going to be out there to be able to visit with you. We also have our Family Matters study that starts this Wednesday that you saw a video about. That will help you invest in your marriage and in your family. And then Rick mentioned a workshop coming up at the first of March, the first weekend, Adventures in Marriage. We are going to host that here at the church. Registration for that workshop opens today, and you've got the link on that card, but it is limited, so it will fill up quickly, so you better act quickly if you want to attend and be part of that. All of that to say, as a church, we are a body of believers, and it is our call to walk together, to encourage one another, to pray for one another, to invest in the relationships in our church, and that marriage relationship specifically, because Rick and Sue are so right. It is foundational for us in everything that we do. So this morning, our worship team is going to come, and we're going to close our service out this morning. And here's what I want to ask. What is your next step? What is it God wants to say to you? What is it you need to do when it comes to marriage? What is the step you need to take? Is it simply those three things that we listed, start spending more time in God's Word, praying together, blessing and serving one another? Do you need to sign up for the workshop? Do you need to commit to being here on Wednesday nights? Maybe you're a couple and you've been married for 40 years, and you say, my marriage is going pretty good. We've learned a lot over the years. Let me ask you this, then whose marriage are you investing in? Is there a younger couple that you were looking at and saying, I could pour into you. I could tell you a lot of things not to do. That's good. That's helpful, right? Maybe your kids live out of town. I bet you wish there were couples where they lived that were willing to come alongside them and say, hey, we'll be there for you if you need something. Maybe you could be that for somebody else's kids right here in Bernie. Right, that's the beautiful thing of a multi-generational church is to be able to do those kinds of things. Maybe this morning you're here and you're like, well, I'm not married, I'm single. What great information to have so that when God, if God does open that door and lead you to someone to, to spend your life with in a marriage relationship, these are great things, principles to know going into that and helps you look for the right kind of spouse. Maybe this morning, just seeing God's design for marriage and how he tells the story of his love for us and his pursuit of us has just caused you to say, I've got value and I've got worth because God has given it to me. He has pursued me. He has loved me even when I'm unlovable. And I am just thankful that I have everything I need because of what Jesus has done for me.